Hello, everybody. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I'm the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of Dream Business Academy, founder of No Hassle Newsletters, which is my awesome done-for-you newsletter program used by over 1,200 small business owners in nine countries. But most importantly, today, I am still the host of Dream Business Radio. We're now in our 10th year. This is episode 522. No, 522. Oh, good Lord. 522, Elizabeth. That's where we are. Welcome to another fantastic live edition of Dream Business Radio. I have a really great guest today, Elizabeth Pamplone. How are you doing today, Elizabeth? I'm doing great. I'm going to have you carry the load today because my tongue is falling off its roller, it seems like. <laughs> but anyway, hey, folks, this episode of Dream Business Radio is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur, or small business owner who is tired of slow to no growth in your business if you're feeling overwhelmed, unfocused, but especially if you want to learn how to create multiple streams of revenue in your business, then you want to be part of this extraordinary virtual mastermind led by me, Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. You can learn more at dreambizcoaching.com, dreambizcoaching.com. Let me tell you about Elizabeth and we'll dive right in and we're going to find out what in the heck is a marketing minimalist. Okay. <laughs> Elizabeth Pampalone, she is a marketing min minimalist. Good Lord. Award she's an award-winning international speaker and podcaster. And she has developed proven formulas that help her and her clients to create one year of marketing content in just five days. Who doesn't want to learn that? Her innovative approach helps overwhelmed business owners and burnt out nonprofit directors to achieve success and freedom through the power of absolute marketing. Elizabeth, once again, welcome to Dream Business Radio. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. I'm guessing in the first two minutes here, you're wondering, is this Jim's first podcast or what? He <laughs> seems to be struggling with the English language. But anyway, um, my loyal listeners, who I have quite a few over, over the last decade, they, they love the marketing strategies. They love the tips. I know they want to learn about absolute marketing and being a marketing minimalist, but they also love, Elizabeth, the stories. I don't know how many podcasts you listen to, but they love the journeys. Like, How'd you become an entrepreneur? Did you go from you know my the backseat of my car to millions of dollars, or did you have a struggle along the way? So, are you a first generation entrepreneur? What what was your journey like to become a uh, a business owner? I think this is the first time I've shared this on a podcast because I've been on over two hundred in the last two years. Wow. Um, so, uh, but I actually am a third generation entrepreneur. Good actually, for you. I could probably take it even back to fourth. Um, and my great grandparents, um, they owned a general store. Mm -hmm. And then my grandfather started a consulting business where he consulted with uh, nonprofits and colleges for fundraising. And then my mom, she ran several businesses when I was growing up, um, just side home businesses. Uh, she made baskets and she also wrote patterns for baskets. And then she also had like a um, scrapbooking company as well. So many you different- You had a lot of role models, right? <laughs> I mean, wow. It, yeah. It's very rare. I mean, I ask that question a lot. It's kind of my standard go-to first question, but so many people, maybe their mom or dad, or maybe yesterday I was interviewing somebody and their great grandmother owned a, like a clothing store. So that must've been like the late 1800s, early 1900s, which it yeah. was. Um, so it's interesting. You mentioned nonprofit. I think your grandfather, is that where you- initially learned about the nonprofit space because your intro, I read that you work in that environment also. Actually, I feel very far removed from a lot of the entrepreneurial stuff in my family history. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of one of those things that, oh yeah, the great grandparents had the general store and oh yeah, your grandfather ran this company for 15 years or 20 years, you know, but they, they weren't happening like in real time for me. And so the only thing I really saw was my mom. Um, and I really didn't think of her as like entrepreneur. It was, she had a side business. It wasn't okay. her full time thing, you know? So it was kind of almost like this thing that was pushed to the side. Like, yeah, yeah, that was done a long time ago. Or, oh yeah, that's just a small In today's thing. terms, it'd be called a side hustle, right? Right, right. And so I think I didn't really... Absor I absorbed it, obviously, but I didn't mm -hmm. really like think about it in those terms. Um, but I, in my journey, I actually went to college for web programming and really? then got a degree in that, got married right away. And then three months after being married, my husband left 
Three months. And, yeah, three months. Oh, he goodness. had a girlfriend, apparently. He had another side hustle, too. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you can um, laugh about it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so he left, and I lost my only job that I'd ever had, which was, well, my only, like, real job. You know, like, mm -hmm. not the high school stuff you do, but my real job, which was being a programmer. I hated it anyway, so it wasn't a sorry, a sad loss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I lost that job because I couldn't function. I was having a really hard time with the divorce. And when my parents were moving to a new state, I moved with them. I had really nothing left where I grew up. And okay. um, I really was like, I don't even know what to do now. I was overqualified. I was underqualified. I was kind of stuck in this middle space, especially starting at the beginning of the last recession. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I decided to uh, start a business on the advice of my mom. Wow. So um, you, you may be that I've, I've interviewed being an online marketer. I've interviewed so many people who are website designers, creators. I think you may be the only person who went to school for that. Now, wh where was that? When and where was that? So that was um, in 2006. Um, okay. I got a two-year degree as a web programmer, not a designer. Okay, oh, I see. And when you say web programming, is that how to build websites or? Um, yeah, but it was learning languages also in, in like Java, JavaScript. So um, C, we we used a lot of that kind of stuff. But it was just learning like a class on that um, intro right. to basic, you know, things like that. So I wasn't really programming programming until I actually got my job where those skills that I learned in one class were kind of forced upon me and I had to learn, learn them for real. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so when did, where did you, where did you call Jacksonville, Florida home, right? Now I do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So you started this business. Um, what is absolute marketing? So the first business I started was not actually a marketing business. Okay. I knew how to market because I had done it for like as side jobs, you know, before I left Ohio. Um, but I, and I knew how to market myself. So my mom actually suggested that I pick two things I like and just make a business mm -hmm. because I was kind of unemployed <laughs> yeah. and living in her house. And so she said, you need to make a business, just pick two things you like. And the two things I liked were old people and computers. <laughs> I was really? 20, so everyone was old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I started a computer repair company and I taught computer classes at senior centers for 10 years. Goodness gracious. And that's something you knew that you enjoyed or how did you know you, yeah. you would do that? Okay. So I loved doing that. I loved computers in general. I had been doing things with computers since I was a teenager and I liked, and I worked at a library when I was a teenager as well. I liked all the older grandparent type people who would come in and not understand any of the things that I completely inherently understood. Right. And so I loved like sharing that with them and helping them with that. So, so how did that lead to absolute marketing? So I was working that um, business. I grew it. I had, um, I got married a second time later on and uh, brought my husband into that business when we basically both had no jobs. Like that was mm -hmm. the only thing that was running our family and income. And, um, I got to this point where he was running the computer side and I was getting jobs, but I knew there was something else I wanted to do. And I said, okay, well now you've got this and you're kind of running it. Let me start the thing I've always wanted to start. And I had done websites for people over the years here and there. I'd done a lot of my own websites, a lot of my own rebrands, all of my own marketing. And I started to get into business networking at this point. I had never done that before because all of my clients were older and residential. And so business networking wasn't even a thing. Okay. So I started in business networking. Uh, someone invited me to a group. I loved it. I was like, this is my thing. I want to help businesses. And so I kind of went back to those roots of websites and programming and used my marketing knowledge that I built over five, six, seven years of running a business and put all that into practice and made a marketing company. Okay. Now in the uh, introduction, I said, you teach people how to create a year's worth of content in five days. The, um, the person I interviewed yesterday in a similar field to yourself was, you know, I said, what are the top one or two things that hold most uh, small business owners back from doing more effective marketing, especially social media, et cetera. Well, first of all, not having the time to generate yeah. the content. And second, if they do have the time, they don't know what to, what to create. Absolutely. Is that is so you agree with that, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, so that your program and how to create a year's worth of marketing in five days, um, 
how do you do that? And is that is that kind of your calling card, so to speak? It is. It's it's our tagline, and it basically it tells you everything you need to know about our marketing firm. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things about my marketing firm is it has two halves. For the first five years of the marketing firm, I did things the way everybody else does them. We did 30 day, 60 day, 90 day websites. We did branding in a month. You know, we just did everything the normal way. After about five years, um, I ended up selling the computer repair business. So now I'm just down to one business. And I also was really sick, really tired, (laughs) Mm -hmm. very stressed. And my husband at that point had gone into another field. And I thought, you know what? This is my time to reset everything because my clients were lacking in the time. And so when I would give them milestones and deadlines, they would never meet them. They would never give me the stuff I needed. It was a fight to the death, basically. And then on the last day of our contract, they would just flood me with all their info. I would drop everything I was doing and build their site in a day. Oh my (laughs) goodness. It was like a, a massive just craziness. And so I said, I'm resetting everything. I took everything off my website at year five. And I just said, I do websites in one day because I knew I was already doing that. So why give myself 29 days of heartburn when I was actually only (laughs) building for one day? (laughs) So I reset everything. And um, my first client was a person who said, I need a brand, a website and 12 months of social media posts and let's get it done. So that's what we did. So, um, so you're able to, I, I don't know how you do it, but so you got a website built in a day. Um, and now that's kind of your your calling card, your brand, but you still need the, the feedback from your clients. So does mm-hmm. that, because there's a shorter timeline, is that making sure they don't like just leave for two or three weeks? It kind of does. So I only work in person. Okay. Um, I'll either go to my client or they'll come to me and mm-hmm. I only do one project at a time. So if we okay. work on the website, the brand is already done. If we work on social, the website should, and the brand should already be done. So we're not trying to do 10 things at once. Okay. So what is uh, a marketing minimalist? I better at least ask you that since I titled (laughs) it that way. (laughs) What is a marketing minimalist? So it's kind of along the lines of the business where there's a lot of things you can do in marketing. We have eight day options that someone could choose from but you don't actually need all of them to be a successful business owner and to have successful marketing. So I'm a minimalist, actually like a real life, regular minimalist where we kind Mm -hmm. of don't have as many things as most people. But what I did was I kind of turned that onto the marketing side and was like, why do we have all these marketing things that we could be doing when it's not all needed? So I've really stripped everything down to eight optional items that you can have in your website or, you know, in your marketing kind of, uh, like plan or whatever your strategy. Um, But really four or five is all you really need to have a successful business. And so I've tried to get people to understand that just because you might want a podcast doesn't mean you have to have one to be successful, Um, but it might help you be successful. So Mm -hmm. we really just kind of strip it down to what people actually need. And that might look different for you or someone else. So when you strip it down, like your average customer, I know it's going to be different for different industries, but your average customer what do you strip it down to? Like I said, you might not need a podcast, but most people know they're going to need a website. They're going to need mm-hmm. social media in this day and age, right? So what are the other must-have components? So a brand isn't really important. A lot of people don't do the brand correctly. A lot of them okay. will kind of pay someone on Fiverr to do a logo and that's it. Or they'll have their friend do it. And it's not really all the pieces and components they need. They don't know their colors. They don't know their fonts. And then we basically have to start all over when we work with them. Um, But really, you do need that solid brand because that's going to make all of the other pieces you create so much easier. The second piece is a very solid website. Your brand has to connect with people and your website has to convert them. So if your website isn't converting them, then you're wasting your time and your money. (laughs) And then your social media, we strip that back to two or three uh, platforms. You don't have to be on all the platforms. A lot of people think you should be on as many as possible, but Mm -hmm. really there's probably two or three that actually your clients are utilizing regularly. Um, Most people don't know that uh, Instagram is actually mostly people under 35. If people under 35 aren't part of your target audience, then maybe Instagram's not for you and you can focus on something else. So um, that's true today. You're saying Instagram is 35 and under primarily. Yes. Yes. Wow. I didn't know that. Hmm. Yeah. That's part of the 2022 statistics. 
Yeah, I see a lot, but I see so many, uh, you know, people I know in business that they're all promoting on there. It's maybe it's, it's working, maybe it's not, user. I guess. It's yeah. the majority user. So you will see people who are maybe older, who've been on online a lot longer, but the majority user and the people that are using it on a regular basis, a daily basis are under 35 majority. Okay. So, um, is there the common to, I mean, Facebook, everybody's probably on Facebook, LinkedIn, would that be number two? Well, it depends on who you're targeting. So I have okay. some companies that target other small businesses. So LinkedIn is actually your primary. Okay. Um, and then Facebook and Twitter may or may not be your secondary, maybe Instagram, depending on the type of small businesses you're targeting. Um, and then if you're targeting people on the residential side or the consumer side, then you're going to be looking at like Instagram, some Facebook and mostly Pinterest. So mm. there's a lot of different strategies mm, that's interesting. from there. Talk to me about Pinterest. How, I mean, back in, back, oh, back in the day, I just sounded horribly old, but <laughs> so both my girls been married about 10 years. And that's when I first learned about Pinterest because they're looking at wedding dresses and stuff. What's that? Well, it's Pinterest, but is Pinterest still a, a tool for growing a small business? It's a huge driving force for businesses who have a product to sell that they can ship. Okay. So if you are making anything from coffee to, um, you know, outerwear to uh, baby products, you know, whatever those things are that you're selling online, whether you have an Etsy store or you have a Shopify store, um, maybe you're making a foot balm for dogs, like I don't know, whatever it is you're making. Your people are actually 10% more likely to purchase if you post it on Pinterest. And wow. the other thing about it is there's a there's something called the half-life of a post. And the half-life of a post is how long it lives in the feed of that platform. So, for example, mm. LinkedIn is about 24 hours. Um, Did Facebook you say half-life? Yeah. It's called half-life. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, what's the other half? So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like the radiation thing, right? So if you have the half-life okay. of radiation, how long is it going to last, right? How long is it going to live? So, um, so the half-life of a post on Facebook is only about 30 minutes, but on um, you know, LinkedIn, it's 24 hours. So you've got some oh. differences there. Um, but on Pinterest, it's about three and a half months for one post. So you get so much more traction from that. But it's not great at reaching business customers. So it's okay. really a, a strategy for someone who's selling something. If you're selling a course or an opt-in, mm -hmm. it's a great way to do that. But it has to be something that's not a physical service, like a okay. cleaning service. So uh, I'm going to ask one more Pinterest question because I know somebody out there yeah. is hoping I will. <laughs> so if you are doing, uh, consume, let's say, consumer sales and, and products that can be shipped, mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing that the photo has to be named and titled correctly. The description, is, is that all SEO'd? And it, does mm -hmm. Pinterest allow a link right in there that takes you to a website? It should take you directly to that product that you're sharing. I so see. for okay. example, you can create a separate Pinterest image that's maybe more enticing to the Pinterest consumer. And there's actually a ton of YouTube videos on that. And there's also YouTube videos on how to write your description and all that. Um, but if sometimes you can literally just post a link and that will actually pull the image that comes from your website, which may be sufficient um, mm. to do that. Also, you can use a video instead or something like that um, as your Pinterest image. Very interesting. Um, so I was checking out your website, as I usually do to prepare. Um, you had, I think it was a blog post or an article, uh, blogging for SEO. In other words, breaking down the the blogging barrier. Can you share a little bit of, cause I've, I've blogged my whole life. Be, I'm not going to say back in the day, but a long <laughs> time ago, there used to be uh, easy articles.com. There's all these different sites, which are essentially a place where you can put your blog, but blog posts is still a very important part of website. I'm guessing you'd agree, right? Cause that's mm -hmm. really how you get some traffic. So talk about blogging for SEO. What should people know? And a two part question, are people doing shorter articles more frequently or are they doing longer articles maybe once a week? So I think the frequency and the length are actually the wrong metric to look at. Um, okay. I think it should be more what people are looking at right now is, is the question being asked online? And so you can go to like answer the public or Google trends to find that information um, for free. And then once you know what the question that's being asked online is, can I answer this question effectively and as in depth as necessary? So for example, you might say that you're a functional medicine doctor and you're going to put out something there's some rules and regulations about what you can and can't say, especially even, you know, lawyers have the same issue. Financial people have the same issue. Right. So you can go as in depth as 
necessary, but you also want to give enough information that someone feels educated after reading it. You don't want it to be too long where it gets boring, but you also want to break it up into kind of bite-sized chunks so that if I already understand a concept, I can skip that paragraph and go to the next one where I might not mm. understand that concept. So um, it's definitely used for SEO. It should be on your website. It should not be on a separate site. Like people use Medium and things like that, but then also have a, a website that you're basically losing SEO. I know you can get paid for those and, you know, you can use Patreon and things, but that's when you're actually selling your content separately. The stuff you want to use for SEO is answering those questions and being the expert has to be built into your site directly. Otherwise, it's not doing you any good. Um, the blogging for SEO idea is something that I actually do as a, a solid eight hour day where we create 12 posts to get people started, um, 12 to 24 posts in one day, written, designed, and scheduled into their website so that they literally have a year of content done. Wow, that's impressive. Um, talk to me about email marketing. I was just talking to my my web guys today, and it just seems like the uh, the open rate, deliverability rate. I mean, it's been a challenge my whole twenty one years in business, but it just seems to be such a struggle anymore. It is, and I think anything above twenty percent, you're you're doing amazing. Yeah. <laughs> if you have twenty yeah. percent of your list opening your your emails, you're already like on the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you're below that twenty percent mark chances are your list is actually dirty. So you probably need to clean it. I have a bunch of tools that I use. One of them is super nice and super inexpensive. It's in our pro toolkit on my website for free. But the tool basically goes through your list and checks, is it a valid address? Um, does it have a lot of hard bounces from other services? Um, is it missing like a period? And that's why it's not going anywhere. And that person's never even getting the email. Um, so it basically shows you what addresses are good, what addresses are bad, and helps you dump the bad ones. This okay. could take your list in for anywhere from, let's say your list is 5,000. It could take it down to 2,500 or even only 1,000. And people feel that loss of that like vanity number of, but I had 5,000 people on my yeah. list. But really, that number is much more effective if you're actually reaching 20 plus, 30, 40, 50% of your list because your list is smaller. Okay. Um, what about, um, I think I saw something else on your website about uh, algorithm proof social media. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't understand what you meant by that. But is that how how long the the uh, the half life, or whatever you said? <laughs> is there a way to beat that? In other words. There is. So a lot of small businesses are never going to actually best the algorithm. It's almost mathematically impossible. So what I have done is created a system and a formula. All of our systems, all of our days are formulaic and we can do them with any business in any structure. Um, and the social media structure, the social media formula basically says to the algorithms, See you later. We're going around, We're going around the mountain, like okay. uh, like Lord of the Rings. We're not going through it, right? <laughs> um, and we're going to just walk around the algorithm, and that means that we're going to be consistent, which which those platforms like. We're going to have good content, and we're going to post live as well. So we're going to have a ton of scheduled content. We create one year of social media posts in a day, which is about three hundred to a thousand posts we create in one day. And then we also create a live posting schedule for our clients where if they have time that week, if they feel like they're not that busy, they can go on to that schedule and they can say, hey, let's post a live video about this. Let's create um, a social post about that. Let's do a reel on this. And so they have a whole plan that they could do live, but they're not forced every single week, every single day to come up with something creative and fun just to be consistent. Hmm. What would you say? Um, I do get a fair number of people who are just starting out. Well, again, whether it's a side hustle or they're just getting started mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe they're feeling overwhelmed and just completely daunted with all the social media and how to write emails, how to write blog posts and call on customers, knock on doors for yeah. prospects. <laughs> how do you get, how does a person who's new to this get started in the marketing world? What would you say? Uh, if they want to be a marketer or if they want to just run a business, I was quite confused on the question. <laughs> No, if, well, when you're starting out, you're running a business, you're the marketer, you yeah. know, you're the chief marketing officer. That's true. That's true. So I would say the brand is the most important thing. A lot okay. of people come to me with the wrong brand. They have the wrong name. They have the wrong colors. They have the wrong look and feel. And then they end up getting a storefront at some point or whatever, and they put it on the sign or they have it on a card. 
and the people they're trying to connect with don't get it. It just doesn't connect. So if they have a brand that actually connects with the audience that's been thought through, um, and this can be done on your own, but it also is good to have that third person looking at it and at least auditing it and saying, hey, have you thought about this? Um, are you connecting with these types of customers? Who is mostly who are most of your customers coming in right now? Oh, if it's none, then we got to fix this first. Um, and then having a really solid website is another great piece. A lot of people think, well, because of social media, websites are just dead. But it's really not true. And the thing is, social media should lead them back to your website because that's where your sale actually happens whether you're selling a product or even a service. So um, you just definitely need those first two pieces. The other stuff will kind of take care of itself as you grow. Mm -hmm. um, but really the first two pieces are the brand and the website so that when you are out knocking on doors, you have this like solid background to, to lean against and be like, yeah, that's my storefront because you don't have that physical location yet or you don't have that big social media presence you have a good brand, you have a good website, and, and those people feel comfortable sharing their business with you because you have such a good presence. What is it? You've, you've used the term, you have a solid website a few times. What is a solid website? 22 pages, three critical pages? Like, what is a solid website as, to start out? Yeah, it could be as short as one page. I usually mm -hmm. recommend having a home page that tells me what I need to know about you. It even could ask me questions so that I relate to you better. Um, and then I need to know clearly on that first page who you are, what you're doing, and who you're you're sharing it with, who you're selling to. Because if I don't connect with you on that first page, I'm going to be gone within three seconds. Mm. Um, and then I like to have a page that explains what those services are. Um, and then, of course, a contact page, which I recommend doing um, a booking a call link. Because if someone is coming to you as the expert, they're more likely to see you as the expert rather than you reaching out to them and saying, please buy from me. <laughs> and they see that as a kind of a role reversal where they're in charge. So right. um, that solid website could even be as little as three pages. But those three elements need to be on if you even have a 22 page website, they still need to have those three elements in it. I, I, I don't know if this was part of your initial answer, how the whole pe people reached out to you in the last day, but is that how you came up with the absolute like marketing system when it yes. absolute to be an old uh, FedEx, when it absolutely positively has to be done? <laughs> is, that, is that where your absolute marketing program came into development? It did because I was so tired of the stress that I felt and I knew that the clients were feeling and I realized that if I could just sit with them for a day, which is what ended up happening at the end of the, the contract, because they were going to be charged more if they went over, because I had more clients coming in at that point. <laughs> and mm. it also gave me the freedom to work with two clients a month, three clients a month, 10 clients a month, rather than being limited. But the absolute part really was, this is the only thing you need. You don't need all the other fluff. You don't need all the other extra maximalism. You need the minimalism approach. And it can really take a lot of the decision making out of what do I do? When do I do it? How do I do it? Because once you go through, typically our clients go be through between three to five days of this type of service and they choose what makes the most sense for them. Once mm -hmm. they go through those three to five days, all the decision making is done. It literally is done for the whole year. Wow. Well, what a fun interview. I'm sure people want to connect with you and learn more from you and uh, maybe reach out and book a call. How should they do that? You can go to getabsolutemarketing.com. You can also download our free resources there. I've taught everything and also our pro toolkit and you can book a call with me. I'd love to chat. So I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that because I didn't hear it. I think there was a little bit of a skip in the Wi-Fi. <laughs> so go, I, don't, I want to make sure everybody gets it. So you can yeah. go to go ahead and give that answer again, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, it's getabsolutemarketing.com. And you can download all of our other free resources are there, as well as the Pro Toolkit. And also all of my videos and everything that I've ever done, all my classes are all there for free. And then also you can book a call with me. Great. Elizabeth, thanks so much for coming on uh, Dream Business Radio Live today. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Hey, folks, that wraps up this very special interview with my guest, Elizabeth Pampolo. Now, I, I, there was one question I was going to ask her. I saw on your website, not the, I saw on your website, did you used to be a ballroom dance instructor? Yes. It's so funny. The, I, don't, don't let her go yet. How, when was that? 
That was um, at the beginning of me starting my business. I didn't know okay. anyone in New City. And so I started ballroom dancing and then ended up being an instructor. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my gosh. That's, I said, I have to ask her that because I, I, I was uh, doing my research. Well, good for you. All right. So it's um, getabsolutemarketing.com. We'll, we'll, yes. we'll end where I should have ended. Okay, <laughs> folks, that wraps up this very special interview with my guest, Elizabeth Pampalone, former ballroom instructor, now a marketer. <laughs> I highly recommend you connect with her follower and learn from her. You can connect with me at getjimpalmer.com. See the word get there comes in again. Getjimpalmer.com. That is my home base. If you're interested again in joining about 27 other smart entrepreneurs in my dream business mastermind, go to dream biz coaching, dream biz coaching.com. Remember part of my legacy program, you can get all six of my Dream Business Building Books for free in their digital format. So that's obviously Kindle on Amazon, Nookbook at barnesandnoble.com, or the iBook store. But until this time next week, I am Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach, and you take good care. <laughs>